Do you know what your NFL team's worst blowout loss is? Do you know if your team has laid a beat down on another squad that put them in therapy? What about your team's rival? How bad did they get it one Sunday afternoon like your sibling getting spanked for selling your bike? Do you know what the worst NFL blowout of all time is? Well, it's time to point and laugh and listen to some terrible jokes. Every NFL team's worst blowout loss is coming up right after this. Okay, so this video took a lot of research and I had to go through every NFL box score and find the games that qualified. Well, not entirely, but football reference helped big time and there was a bit of legwork I needed to do to get my data. The criteria is the game must have occurred from 1966 on the year of the first Super Bowl, what we deem the modern era of the NFL. So I had to disqualify some games even though the blowouts were pretty juicy. I also included the postseason so Dolphins fans, you know what's coming. <laughs> Lastly, the list is sorted from lowest to highest margin, culminating with the worst blowout in the history of the NFL. Let's do this. The biggest blowout to ever occur outside of the United States as in 2017, it looked as if the Ravens left their defense back in Maryland, a 44-7 ass whooping at the hands of the Jaguars in London. Blake Boltzels threw four TD passes and it got so bad that Chad Henney went in for a few series. Joe Flacco looked about as effective as telling teenagers to be abstinent and the Ravens only score came from a Ryan Mallett TD with three minutes left. Not many people remember that the 86 Bears were a tough squad and the defending champs still had many of their Super Bowl shuffle players from the year before, including their defense that picked off Boomer Esiason four times in this game. The Bengals could only muster 60 yards rushing as this game was the worst beatdown in their franchise history, but hey, it won't be as bad as the others you are about to see. Well, wasn't 2017 just so special for the Jags as Saxonville didn't just punch people in the mouth, they also punched the ball in the end zone. In this week 15 beatdown, the Texans got held to 186 yards of total offense and gave up four sacks. Blake Bortles went 21 of 29 for 326 yards and three TDs. More surprising is that the Texans haven't gotten blown out by more in their history as bad as they have been. There are some nasty shutouts on this list, but this one is the first. Dan Fouts started for the Chargers and was three for 36 with 99 yards and four picks for a rating of 5.1. All of the Falcons' five TDs came on the ground. The Chargers finished 2-11 and won that year. Their tie was against, you guessed it, the Browns. Why are you bringing up old shit? Remember when John Gruden coached the Raiders and they were actually good? You gotta go back nearly 20 years for that and in 2000, the Raiders laid a smackdown on the Panthers. Trailing 24-9 at the half, Steve Berline got hurt and well, that didn't matter because the Raiders offense was unstoppable back then. Jeff Lewis didn't fare much better as the Panthers ended up losing by a final of 52-9. The Bears issued a 44-0 whipping on their way to an 11-0 start. Tom Landry was the coach of the Cowboys who were 7-3 at the time and would win the NFC East at 10-6. The Bears D had two pick sixes for TDs. They knocked out survivor Gary Hogaboom early who went 6-22 for 22 for 60 yards and three INTs, a line that would make Nathan Peter meme jealous. A QB rating of zero. Walter Payton threw one pass for 33 yards and his rating was 118.7. 1995 was the Jags' first year and they were a full season from the AFC Championship game. Steve Berline was also part of this Brazzers level pounding as he got picked three times. The Lions still had Barry Sanders and he shredded the Jags like the FBI does documents. The 1984 Niners were really 
really good, and they shit on a lot of teams on their way to an 18-1 record and winning the Super Bowl. This 51-7 blowout got so bad the Vikes put in Archie Manning in one of his last games. Joe Montana threw three TDs and then sat. The Vikes had an abysmal season, finishing 3-13. Before the Legion of Boom, there was the platoon of suck, and in 1980, the Seahawks got all they could handle from the Cowboys, who laid a 51-7 beatdown on them in the Kingdom. It would have been 51-0 if Jim Zorn didn't throw for a two-yard fourth-quarter TD. Here's what Earl Thomas thinks of this game. Now that our Lord and Savior Pat Mahomes is here, Chiefs fans have long forgotten that back in 1984 they got worked by the Seahawks 45 zappy. The Hawks only scored one touchdown on offense as their defense had four interception returns for touchdowns of 58, 56, 76, and 90 yards. The Chiefs threw a total of five picks spread over three QBs. Even more insulting to the Chiefs fans, their squad got blown out by the same score in 1976. Thank goodness this was a long time ago, but the Cowboys issued a severe beatdown on the Giants back in 66. The game was tied 7-7 after the first quarter, but then Don Meredith went off. Throwing for five TDs, three of them to future Giants head coach Dan Reeves. The Giants finished 1-12-1 that year. More Rich Gannon-led slaughter. How did the Raiders not win a Super Bowl? Oh, yeah. The Bucks just didn't have it against Gruden's Raiders, who did it mostly on the ground with Napoleon Kaufman and Tyrone Wheatley rushing for over 110 yards and two TDs each. It's all good. The Bucks got him back three years later when Bill Callahan mailed them their Super Bowl ring. Remember Spygate and how pissed off Belichick was at the league that they dare question his integrity? Well, during that season, the Pats decided that running up the score was their mission, as in this Week 8 contest, they beat up the skins like an old dirty rug. TB12 rushed for two TDs and threw for three more, one to linebacker Mike Vrabel. Oh look, it's that same asshole New England squad that was running up the score as if it helped their BCS ranking. On four consecutive possessions, Brady threw TDs to Randy Moss, who had 128 receiving yards and was a fantasy monster that day. The Bills actually had 229 yards of offense, but they started J.P. Lossman. What happened to the Pats that year? Dan Reeves again was all over this blowout as he not only caught three passes for 41 yards, but he rushed for 25 yards and two TDs and also completed two passes for 43 yards. The Lions are the team to score the most points in their largest blowout at 13. Every cloud, right? On a more positive note, the good news is I've been promoted. So, every cloud. Our first playoff game entry, the Giants smashed Joe Montana in the mouth and the rest was history. The Giants did not even score any points in the fourth quarter as their stingy run defense only allowed 29 yards on the ground. Joe Montana obviously didn't return after that hit. Billy White Shoes Johnson did the most damage in this one, a 47-point shutout. He ended the scoring with a 75-yard kickoff return. Ken Burrow caught six passes for 180 yards and two TDs in a fantasy player's dream. Though in 1977, the internet hadn't been invented by Al Gore and people did things like bet on football games and get their legs broken when they didn't pay up. The Jags once again jump all over another team. This time it was the Mark Brunel squad of the early 2000s, beating up the second year expansion Browns who started Spurgeon win. Future Eagles coach Doug Peterson even got in this game. Fred Taylor rushed for 181 yards and three TDs in this salty teabagging. This game is interesting because Joe Montana actually came in to relieve Steve Young, who started and threw three TDs before Montana came in and threw two TDs of his own. 
Steve Dills was the Ram starter who went 5 of 17 for 50 yards. Many years later, it would be Steve Young deposing Montana and the 49ers blowing out another team in awful fashion in the Super Bowl. Though technically this was an AFL game, it's still an awful footnote in Broncos history. George Blanda threw for a TD, kicked a field goal, and kicked six extra points again, the sick fantasy line. The Broncos would finish 3-11. It's pretty rare the Browns have anything on the Steelers as the black and yellow crew has treated them like a gigapet for the last 50 years. However, in 1989, the Browns laid a week one beatdown on them that should have been stopped early. Bernie Kosar was mediocre in this game. It was kicking defense and running that did Bubby Brister and the Steelers in. <laughs> it started Bubby Brister. How do you make a perfect season more perfect? By taking a dump all over the Patriots on their field to the tune of a 52-0 shutout ass whipping. Jim Plunkett started for the Pats and was terrible, and Mercury Morris ran roughshod over the defense and scored three TDs. The Dolphins later capped this undefeated year with a Super Bowl win while the Patriots finished 3-11. Remember when Derek Carr had all that potential and was going to be good? Remember when Khalil Mack was a Raider? Well, not too long ago, both of those things were true, except one fine November day, Mr. 7 and 9 laid a 52-point pounding on the black hole. Trey Mason went off 117 rush yards and two rushing TDs and caught three balls for 47 yards and a TD. Damn, son. Though there are four miracles at the Meadowlands, there is one ass whipping at Yankee Stadium. And in 1972, the Giants put the hurt on the Philly Philly. Norm Sneed started for the G-Men, who then gave way to Randy Johnson, who went four of five for 152 yards and two TDs for a perfect QB rating of 158.3. And remember folks, four is greater than one. Have the Pats ever not owned the Jets? Oh, that one time. Can't wait! I guess. Steve Grogan absolutely went off this game, throwing five TDs in three quarters and then enjoying his afternoon off as his team laid a 56-3 shellacking on the Jets. Harold Jackson crossed three of those TDs. Bears fans rejoice. Here's a rare example of you owning the Packers in something. Walter Payton was a monster in this game, as was Vince Evans, who was 18 of 22, 316 yards and three TDs for a perfect QB rating of 158.3. Perfect. Remember Suck for Luck? Well, the Colts really bought into that mission, as in 2011, they sucked harder and better than they ever have before in getting blown out by 55 points. The Saints, who would win a Super Bowl at the end of the season, surgically dismantled the Colts with two rushing TDs and five passing TDs, all from golden boy Drew Brees. I hope the Saints at least left $100 on the Colts dresser after this affair. Many of you probably thought of this game first as a memorable ass whipping as it was Dan Marino's send off and a despicable one too. The Dolphins actually beat the Seahawks in a playoff game the week before. I forgot the Seahawks were an AFC team once, but then ran into the buzzsaw that was the 14 and two Jags. Marino looked his age as he went 11 for 25 with one TD and two INTs. Fred Taylor blew the game open with a 90 yard run and the Jags never looked back. Another brutal opener that, okay, I was gonna do this one all serious, but the starting QB for the Falcons this game was named Dick Shiner. Dick Shiner, that's all I got. I bet you are sweating if your team hasn't been mentioned yet, but this ass whooping was nasty as Russell Wilson and the Legion of Boom established themselves as a team on the rise. Marshawn Lynch did Marshawn things like rush for 128 yards and three TDs. Robert Turbin also had 108 rushing yards. The Cards started John Skelton as their QB, so yeah. 
What's interesting about this game is that though it's tied for the largest blowout in the Super Bowl era, it could have been the biggest one had the Rams kicker Tom Dempsey not missed three extra points. But that didn't matter as they beat up the Falcons to the tune of 59 Zappy. And how much did Tom Dempsey miss those extra points by? About one foot. Yes, I am going to help. And the number one all-time worst blowout in the Super Bowl era, because it happened the most recently. What's worse than being 0-6? Losing in historical fashion to the freaking Patriots. Kerry Collins started for the Titans and went 2 for 12, minus 7 yards, and an INT. Tom Brady was unstoppable, and in three quarters he went 29 of 34. 380 passing yards and threw for six TDs. He completed a pass to nine different receivers. The Titans actually finished eight and eight that year, which prolonged Jeff Fisher's tenure one more agonizing season. And for good measure, a bonus blowout as the greatest whooping ever in the NFL, regardless of era, was the 1940 NFL championship game where the Bears blew out the Redskins 73 to nothing. Amazingly, the Bears went for two on their last score, not to insult the Redskins, but because they kicked so many balls into the stance, the ref asked them to go for two so they could keep playing. This game was the first nationally broadcast football contest, and boy, did the fans get a treat. Well, there you have it. Maybe you learned something today. Maybe you knew all of these. Maybe you are John Clayton in your basement. Who knows? But if you like this, you can check out my videos on every NFL team's most cheatingest moment or each NFL team's largest blown leads. I'm Five Points Vids, and you made it to the end of this video.